All right. I'm Shane Billings with Rockland Public Library. Thanks for bearing with us. And we are thrilled to have you this evening. Uh, we will be getting started here with David Yarborough's talk and the question and answer session at the end will be done uh, via the chat box. So if you have a question, feel free to type that in anytime. It will remain there. We'll do our best to get to all the questions. Thanks to the friends of Rockland Public Library for their support of our programming throughout the year. And a couple programs coming up. We have next week on September 24th at 6.30 p.m. Amesel Ponty, radio host and music journalist, will be discussing the local music scene in Portland, Maine, as well as the impact of the pandemic on live music performances this year. She will also give an overview of her own career as a music journalist and radio host and talk about some of her favorite music of 2020. And in two weeks on Thursday, October 1st at 6.30 p.m., we will have our second Camden Conference Rockland Public Library community event of the season. Daniel Bookham will be talking about his adventures in Emma Salick, and we can't wait for that program co-sponsored with Camden Conference. If you're interested in either of those programs, both of which will be on Zoom, send me an email at sbillings at rocklandmaine.gov and I'll make sure that you get the link to attend. <clears throat> Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome David E. Yarborough for a talk on Maine's wild blueberry industry. David is the Emeritus Wild Blueberry Specialist with Cooperative Extension and the Emeritus Professor of Horticulture in the School of Food and Agriculture at the University of Maine, where he worked for 40 years. David attended the University of Maine. He received a BS degree in wildlife management in 1975 and an MS degree in resource utilization in 1978. He received his PhD in plant and soil science from the University of Massachusetts in 1991. He has worked with wild blueberry growers in Maine and Canada to educate them on best management practices that enabled them to increase their efficiency of production and profitability. David was recognized by the IR4 program when he received the Meritorious Service Award in 2006. Among his other honors is the Outstanding Service and Long-Term Commitment Award from the Wild Blueberry Producers of Nova Scotia presented to him in 2016. We are thrilled to welcome David Yarborough and I'm handing the stage over to you, David. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shane. Uh I always appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, talk about wild blueberries. I'd like to uh, give a credit for the first slide. Uh, Margaret Nagel, who is with uh, Public Affairs at the University of Maine, did this as a summer painting, a summer, summer school a painting for the University of Maine. And I liked it so much, I use it uh, on all my talks now to start out with. So uh, when I uh, give these talks, I, I really like to start at, at the beginning and the beginning uh, of wild blueberries really goes back quite a ways. Uh, during about the last ice age, about 25,000 years ago, Maine was covered with uh, probably uh, one or two miles of ice. And as that uh, glacier receded uh, approximately 10 to 15,000 years ago, uh, what happened was a, a very barren landscape uh, without any plants on it at all. All of the soil was pushed out into, uh, into the ocean uh, where the nutrients went to feed the cods. And there really wasn't much uh, for, uh, for blueberries to, to grow on. They actually uh, migrated uh, from the south. And, and a lot of kids, I, I ask, uh, well, how did they get here? Uh, did they walk? Did they fly? Did they swim? And actually, it was two out of three. Uh, they got here via seed uh, from birds and bears eating the blueberries and distributed them and distributing that across the landscape. Well, that landscape was pretty barren and open uh, and uh, these blueberries were, were here when the, when the settlers came and the Native Americans were here, they preceded them and uh, they uh, survived in the end of story of the forest. But initially there wasn't really any kind of uh, nutrients in the soil and the wild blueberries uh, had some help in establishing themselves there. And that was uh, from an infection. 
a fungal infection, you might say, well, fungal infection doesn't sound good, but this particular one was a symbiotic relationship where the fungus uh, uh, colonized the roots of the blueberries. Uh, they're able to pull mineral nutrients out of the soil. And for that, the blueberries gave it uh, sugars. Uh, so they traded uh, nutrients for sugars and wild blueberries were able to establish on a landscape uh, where uh, many other plants could not establish. And so this is called the early successionary species and wild blueberries were among uh, the first uh, inhabitants in Maine to, to colonize the landscape. We do have two types of blueberry and, and the wild blueberry is a, low, is a low bush type that grows along the ground. There's a low sweet blue, blue, blueberry and then there's also the sour top or velvet leaf uh, low bush blueberry. And all they, although they look very much the same, uh, genetically they're different and they can't even cross pollinate. Uh, so they are two very distinct species. About 95% of the blueberries in Maine are the low sweet blueberries and not the, uh, not the sour top though as predominant species. If we look where wild blueberries are grown, uh, pretty much along the coast of Maine, uh, into New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland, and around Lake uh, St. John and Quebec. So they're concentrated in Maine, Atlantic Canada, uh, and in Quebec. Unlike the other type of blueberry, which we call the regular blueberry or high bush or cultivated blueberry, uh, these bushes are about six foot tall. Uh, they're propagated uh, by cuttings uh, planted in three to five years. Uh, they grow up and they are picked by hand uh, for the uh, fresh market. They also have very large machines that go over the row that shake the berries off. And those uh, berries do go in, get frozen and compete uh, against our wild blueberries. Now cultivated blueberries are grown worldwide, although they are a North American fruit. Uh, you can find them in Europe, South Africa, Australia, China. So they're throughout the world and that is because they can be easily propagated and grow very rapidly and are very productive. Now the major re difference between the wild blueberry, cultivated blueberry and, and the other, other berry here is a European blueberry. The large blueberry in the middle is the, uh, the cultivated blueberry. Uh, the one on the right hand side is our wild blueberry and on the left is a European bilberry, much darker, much uh, smaller than our blueberry. Another difference between the wild and the blue, uh, wild blueberries and the cultivated blueberries is the cultivated blueberries uh, with the, on, in the graph with the red line show that it has a very narrow, uh, narrow uh, range of, uh, of producti well, productivity. It, it's selected for much higher productivity uh, versus the wild blueberries are natural population. So we tend to, in, in a cultivated field, you might have uh, six or more varieties of the high bush blueberry. Whereas in wild blueberry fields, we literally have hundreds and thousands of different uh, plants. And uh, that gives us a much greater genetic diversity and a much more variable fruit and a much uh, greater flavor. Uh, texture differences in uh, color, uh, many differences in the wild blueberry versus the, the cultivated blueberry. David, we're getting a couple of reports that the slides are not advancing. They aren't advancing. Um, I have two comments that they're, the slides are not advancing for them. Well, is everybody else advancing? Because they, they advance on my machine, do they advance on yours? So the, the slides are only going to advance um, if, you, if, if you control them. Yes. Yep, uh, so, so you're seeing them advance? Yes. Okay, I'm now having four people who are not um, seeing them. Hmm. Well, uh, uh, and, and the other people can't see them. Um, I now have almost six reports that they're not seeing the slides advance. Um, okay. Um, the only thing I can do is switch machines. Uh, uh, the, the slides are advancing for me on my machine. Let's see if we can do a quick uh, tech 
troubleshooting for you. It's a little bit hard for me to do that. Um, yeah, I'm slide. Here. I'm on slide eleven, and it shows it on my computer and on my external screen that that they have advanced. But if they're not, um, again, um, the only the only thing I can do is. Um, uh, David, if you go down to your screen share option. Okay, hold on a second. Sure. Um, I'm going to have to. Uh, screen share. Oops. Um, I just dropped out of there. It's just a matter of making sure you have it in presenter view. So sure. Okay. And, um, Okay. Presenter view in 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 PowerPoint or yes in PowerPoint, <clears throat> and then it should give you the option to resume slideshow, and you can try again. I all right. I'll bring my slideshow up. Resume slideshow. And now, and now let's give it a try. Didn't resume though. No? All right, here we go. And now, are you seeing it advance, David? Um, there we go. I'm going there backwards. Go. Yeah. I'm going forward. So we now are seeing advancing slides. That's wonderful. Okay. Very good. I guess we should have run through the slides first. There we go. We all set to continue? Yes. Uh, good. Okay. So, uh, main, uh, th this is a, a Google Earth uh, view of the main wild blueberry barrens uh, around uh, the Township 18, Township 19 uh, area. And you can clearly see the wild blueberry fields uh, along uh, in, in through the woods. Maine has about 44,000 acres of wild blueberries and actually has the two largest fruit farms in the United States. Uh, Cherryfield Foods and Wyman's are both the, the largest so you'd think that California would have. But uh, with our wild blueberries, we have uh, very large operations, uh, two of the companies have uh, in excess of 10,000 acres uh, each. Uh, so we do have the largest fruit farms. The other difference between wild blueberries and cultivated blueberries is our blueberries are pruned every other year. Uh, we have a prune field and a crop field. The prune field uh, after pruning has vegetative growth and the crop field is harvested. And then that field is pruned again. So we have a two year production cycle that allows us to maintain high productivity in our field. Generally with other plants, you prune out the old stems and the new stems come in uh, because we have a lot of small stems close to the ground, we have to prune the whole field itself. And blueberries used to be pruned by burning. Uh, the earliest management uh, was just to uh, set fire to the fields uh, five or six or seven years after enough debris built up in the fields. In the 1950s, uh, they adopted this flamethrower and basically it's an oil tank with a blower and flames out. And when the oil prices were about uh, three cents a gallon, uh, this made a lot of sense. But given the uh, expensive oil and uh, the carbon footprint, uh, this is done very, very rarely now, uh, just on a few uh, uneven fields, or maybe some of the organic fields are still being burned. We had to do this uh, because of the rocks. Uh, the large rocks in the fields really prevented it from being mechanically harvested or uh, uh, mechanically mowed. And so these had to be removed. And probably 20 years or so ago, uh, they started removing the rocks with very large excavators. Uh, they'd pull the rocks out and track across the, the fields. And this would make the fields level enough uh, to be pruned uh, with a mower and also to be harvested uh, with a, a machine as well. And these were the two 
uh, most expensive inputs uh, for wild blueberries. And so this actually enabled us to continue to, uh, to be productive and uh, stay competitive in our fields. The, um, there is quite a few rocks uh, in, in these fields, as you can see. They generally dump them off to the side, but if you do want any free rocks, I'm sure they would uh, let you have them. All you have to do is come and get them. This is uh, the mower. Uh, this is a, a, a really custom mower built, and what it has is a, a flail type mower, and it's articulated to follow the contour. They're about three feet, feet wide, and they're able to prune the plants about to an inch to the ground, and it's important to get those plants uh, pruned very, very low to the ground in order to uh, maintain the productivity. And we can do this uh, because two thirds of the wild blueberry plant is actually underneath the ground in this uh, rhizome, this underground rhizome uh, that you see uh, is two thirds of the biomass of the plant. So we're just clipping the tops off and these, uh, these stems are regrowing. This is a prune field, uh, uh, an example. It has no fruit production. And you can see that there are different colors. This is a different color in, in, uh, in the center. There, there, there are large green colors. In the foreground, uh, there are different colors of the plants. And these are individual plants that started from one seed and have grown. We have uh, approximately 4 million different types of clones in our wild blueberry fields. And we have uh, plants that have been there prior to the Civil War and to the size of uh, a football field. Uh, so they, they do grow uh, very, uh, spread very well over time. Also in the fall, you can see the color is uh, much better. Uh, a lot of the leaf peepers uh, that come down to, to see the, the oaks, and, I mean the maples in, in, uh, in their fall color also go down through the blueberry barrens and uh, are able to see the wild blueberries and their, uh, in, the, in, in the red color in the fall. This open land provides uh, wildlife habitats and increases land values. Maine has about 95% forest, so having this uh, open land is, is very important to, uh, to, to have some views and also to uh, have some habitat uh, for something like the wild turkey. Uh, they've really uh, come into the blueberry fields. We also have uh, an upland plover uh, that utilizes uh, blueberry field habitat. So we have some very open habitat uh, that allows for, or for some of these uh, different birds, bears, and animals to, to uh, have uh, some open fields. The winter provides some snow. The leaves drop off the, the wild blueberry plants uh, as in the upper left. And uh, the buds start to swell in April and May. We start to see uh, the plants breaking out for flowering. But we also have other, lots of other uh, insects that are interested in wild blueberry fields that have evolved along with our wild blueberry fields, including spanworm, flea beetles, uh, leaf beetles that chew on, on, on the stems themselves. And we have a, a, a method, a sweep net type method that we use to monitor for the insects. And you can see in the background uh, where she's sweeping uh, that those plants are eaten right back to the ground by probably a span worm or flea beetle. So what we wanna do is try to monitor these populations and catch the populations before they destroy the plants. And so we have threshold levels established so that we can spray if we need to, and if we don't, uh, then we don't need to spray. Another serious disease in wild blueberries is the mummyberry disease. And if you can see uh, in, the, in the frame with the blueberries, there's these little white crinkled up berries. Uh, those are the mummyberries and they're uh, uh, basically invaded by a fungus uh, that blights the leaves and, and causes uh, the, also the blossoms to blight. And for, uh, it has a very small mummy and these, uh, the, the blighting uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the leaves is the primary stage and can greatly reduce production. But you notice in, in the photograph in the upper right, there are lots of blueberry plants that aren't affected. And this is one of the advantages of that genetic diversity that all the plants aren't the same. Uh, so they're not affected uh, uh, equally uh, from this disease. There's some research that's been done in Canada that shows us uh, the, the amount of wetness 
that we have and also the temperature during the infection period when those mummy berries are, are coming out in the, in the spring. And we can determine whether there is a, a high prob probability of, uh, of having an infection in, in the fields. Uh, we also have weather stations out in the fields that monitor for temperature and moisture. All this uh, information is on the web in real time uh, that growers can go to. Uh, we also, uh, our pathologist, Shauna Annis, also calls blueberry growers uh, on a, as a hotline for blueberry growers to call into. And they also can uh, um, log into the website uh, to, uh, for a, uh, a blog and a, uh, uh, emails that are sent out to indicate when they do have infections. This, um, at this point in time, then again, we can spray, but this is, a, this is a protectorant. This actually prevents the blueberry plants from being infected and causing that disease. Another pest that we have had, uh, and this has kind of uh, come along with, uh, with the wild blueberry and evolved with the wild blueberry, is the wild blueberry uh, maggot uh, or fruit fly. Uh, there lays an egg and there's a maggot in the fruit. And this became a real issue uh, really in the 1950s when they started canning wild blueberries. Uh, you'd open the can and you have this very thick layer of cream on the top, which is actually the maggots that were cooked and floated to the top. So this was an issue that was addressed by a, a USDA scientist, uh, Frank Lathrop. Uh, he determined what the, uh, the life cycle of the, um, of, the, of the blueberry fly was and determined uh, how to uh, control it. Uh, back, uh, back then they had uh, fairly uh, in, inorganic sprays of something like calcium arsenate, uh, which is very persistent uh, and toxic. And uh, this is, uh, shows uh, uh, the start one and you notice the beehives in the middle uh, going to be hit. Uh, that was not a good uh, promo, uh, uh, good photo to promote that. We do now have uh, a way to monitor for the fly. We use this uh, Faircon AM, which is an apple maggot trap. Uh, we can trap the flies. It has a sticky, uh, sticky uh, surface and it also has a bait to attract the flies. And we can determine when they come and how many there are uh, so as to uh, let us know if and when or not to spray uh, in these fields again. Frank Drummond, uh, uh, another entomologist, also did some work on the, the biology and behavior of the fly. And those flies come in uh, from the fields that were in crop last year uh, and they're, they're now pruned so there are no fruit in that field. So the flies come over, the, over from the other fields and they also come into the woods, but they're not very good or strong flyers. So they only come in about 20 feet and that's below our threshold level. So what we can do is we can just uh, spray the perimeter of the field and then we can uh, reduce uh, the amount of spray that we need to use by 80% in most cases. Also, if there are just uh, small spots in the fields where they show up and not, uh, not in the whole field, we can just spot spray those, those areas, even further reducing uh, the, amu the amount of uh, sprays that we need to, to have. Springtime uh, comes in the, in the crop year and uh, probably between uh, May 20 and 30 down east, uh, we get wild blueberry bloom. And this is a kind of a, a, a bell-shaped blossom with very heavy, uh, very heavy pollen. So it really has to be insect pollinated. Uh, things like black flies just don't cut it. They can't, uh, they can't pollinate the blueberries. We do have quite a few different bees uh, in the fields. We, we do bring in honeybees. Uh, which is a major pollinator source, but we also have bumblebees. And these bumblebees are both native and also you can buy the, uh, what they call quads out of Detroit. They uh, have bumblebees in them. They're shipped in, in a, a cardboard, uh, wax coated cardboard box uh, by UPS and you pull the plug and let them out and they'll work uh, when it's cold, when it's wet, uh, long days uh, versus a honeybee is a Mediterranean bee and will only work when it's nice and sunny and warm. Uh, so having these honey, uh, extra pollinators in the field uh, really uh, help improve our productivity. We also have other bees that, uh, and these are called adrenids, and it kind of looks like a uh, uh, ant mound, little holes in the field, but there's also a little colony of bees in there. 
and their entire life cycle is just keyed into the blueberry bloom season. So these are very specialized and we try to encourage that habitat in the fields as well. This is a, a graph that kind of shows the, uh, the relationship between the number of beehives we have on the bottom and then the yield in thousands of pounds. And you can see without any, any honeybees at all, we get about uh, 1,200, 1,200 to 1,500 uh, pounds per acre. But in order to improve our productivity, we need to put hives in the field. And if we bring the hives up to about four hives, we can get nearly uh, 5,000 pounds an acre, which is about a five-fold increase uh, by, uh, by using these uh, extra pollinators. This is another graph that shows over time, uh, going back to uh, 1985, where we had on the bottom the number of hives, and on the top the wild blueberry yield in uh, millions of pounds. And we can see that with the thousands of hives, we can produce a much higher level of uh, blueberry productivity, and there's a very strong correlation of an increase in the number of pollinators and the increase in blueberry production uh, for our fields. These uh, pollinators do three things. Uh, one, they give us more berries. Two, they give us bigger berries because more seeds uh, produce a bigger berry. And three, they have more even ripening. So all these three factors together greatly enhance uh, wild blueberry productivity. And after controlling the weeds and getting good growth, it's really one of the most important factors in, in providing uh, high productivity for, for the wild blueberry growers. We also have irrigation systems. A lot of the, the larger uh, uh, landowners and growers have uh, irrigation systems. And this allows us to uh, provide water as it's beginning much drier in the, in the years, uh, uh, in recent, recent years and irrigation has uh, been an important additive, especially this year in order to save some of those fields and uh, not lose the plants. Uh, a lot of the smaller growers that didn't have irrigation this year, the plants dried up and they weren't able to uh, harvest at all. Uh, they just abandoned the crop this year. The wild blueberries, again, uh, are different than the cultivated in that they have a once over harvest. So uh, they look for the peak of uh, ripeness in the fields and they go through with a harvest uh, just one time versus the cultivated people, uh, cultivated uh, blueberries might be picked four or five times by hand and then once by machine at, at the end. And we can only do this once. And blueberry fields have been a, a real tradition in Maine. Uh, this is a, a, a photograph by David Brooks Stress and it was in the Portland Museum of Art. Uh, but it was a tradition that a, a lot of locals uh, would, would uh, rake uh, a lot of people would take their summer vacations and come and, and rake blueberries for four weeks. And, and they, they were able, able to, uh, you know, make money for clothes and uh, for um, some supplemental income. So it was a, a pretty good uh, uh, source of uh, labor uh, years ago. We also had uh, a cleaner in the field. It's called a winnow machine. And they picked the... Uh, the, or rake the berries into uh, small baskets. I run this through a blower, which would blow out the sticks and the leaves and they'd fall into the wooden boxes. And then they'd bring these boxes uh, into the processing plants, mostly to a can early on, and then uh, starting in, in the, the late 50s, 60s into freezing. Back in the 50s, Maine was the largest blueberry producer in, in the country. Uh, uh, more than the cultivated. The cultivated industry had uh, been starting about, started about 50, 50 years earlier than that, but at this point in time, uh, Maine was uh, still the, the largest producer. That's changed quite a bit. Uh, if you look at the, the pie graph coming up here, you can see the western region now has uh, the greatest uh, production of blueberries. Uh, states like uh, Washington State are now producing over 100 million pounds of blueberries. Also, there's been a lot of uh, blueberries uh, produced in uh, the South. Georgia was the peach state, but actually now it, it produces a, a, a significant amount, almost 100 million pounds of blueberries as well. And uh, the Northeast uh, section of that, uh, that graph has decreased uh, down to about 10%. If you look uh, 
me see, that didn't show here. There we go. At this other graph, uh, pie chart that came in here, cultivated blueberries are now about uh, two thirds to three quarters of all of the blueberries produced in North America with the Canadian wild producing about 22% uh, in Maine, really now is under 10%. Uh, and it's not that we haven't grown, uh, our productivity has grown from uh, 20 million pounds to 100 million pounds, but also the productivity of, wild, of all blueberries uh, cultivated in wilds in Canada as well has grown uh, significantly. Blueberries were uh, not picked, but raked with a small hand rake uh, in the lower right hand corner shows you with a, it looks like a dustpan with a handle on backwards with spring steel teeth. And this is raked up through the berries. This has been modified now to a much larger rake uh, that's two to three times as large uh, with handles on either side. Uh, so ergonomically, it's much easier to harvest. And with the weeds control, they can control, they can, uh, able to uh, harvest a lot more blueberries uh, much uh, quicker with these types of rakes. We also switched from going into those uh, five gallon buckets uh, into raking right into the wild blueberry box, which are now plastic. And we found this uh, helps improve the quality of the blueberries and that these leaves uh, kind of cushion the berries. And also the more you handle the blueberry, uh, the less the quality, you degrade the quality each time you pour those berries or handle them. So this is a way to uh, improve the quality of the blueberries and save the labor of being able to have to clean those in the field. This is a, a, a wild blueberry a machine harvester. And you can see on the left-hand side, there are two picking reels uh, which go along and they scoop the berries up and they go off to a conveyor on the right and back into very large boxes on the back of the tractor. So. They've eliminated anybody on the back of the tractor. We also notice on the top of the tractor, there are lights. And uh, so these machines, uh, because the fields are large and they're flat, uh, can be harvested at night. And this is something that is done out in the Pacific Northwest and actually improves the quality of the blueberry uh, because as the, as the temperature goes down at night, the berries firm up and that improves their ability to be picked and not bruised uh, during the harvest process. We also have some small uh, walk behind harvesters. This one on the left hand side is uh, made in Columbia Falls, Maine uh, by a Wild Blueberry Equipment Company. It's designed after a cranberry harvester, uh, but it works uh, much better and is much more efficient. Uh, the one on the right just kind of looks like a, a small motorized rake on wheels. And again, that just combs through the berries and falls back into a, a box uh, underneath uh, where the wheels are. Uh, to harvest. So these are, these are, high, uh, these are aids that uh, greatly uh, improve the, the ability for the small growers to also harvest their, uh, harvest their berries as well. The, 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 the berries uh, themselves are usually put into uh, refrigerated reefers uh, when going out of the field if they have to travel any distance. And this cools down the, the fruit that uh, takes the, uh, the field heat uh, out, of the, uh, out of the berries and again, maintains and improves the quality by doing that. Generally, uh, these are some of the small half bushel boxes which are still used on some of the harvesters and they use for hand harvesting. Uh, these are brought into the processing plants. We have six uh, processing plants in, in Maine uh, that, that process wild blueberries down east uh, in Washington and Hancock counties. Uh, and generally they try to uh, process those uh, fruit within 24 hours so as to maintain the quality uh, and have not, not having them sit around. This is an industrial size blower. Uh, this blower uh, removes all the sticks and, and the leaves and uh, instead of having a, a, a machine in the field, uh, this is much more efficient and actually much more powerful and does a much better job in cleaning, uh, cleaning the debris out of the fruit after it's raked. We also wash the fruit and uh, water bass, and they have riffle bass to remove any dirt or deer pellets or any other foreign debris that might have got in there when they're harvesting the berries to make sure that uh, they are all cleaned up. Then the berries go through uh, a tunnel and it's called instant quick freeze. Uh, a minus 40 degree draft of air is pushed up through the berries. 
And these berries are all individually frozen. And after that, they're pretty much uh, indestructible uh, if they are kept frozen. And so they're able to uh, easily uh, pour those berries in and raise them. Uh, uh, when, or pour the berries into containers, 30 pound boxes or bins. They also go through another process of uh, cleaning. And this is with a laser sorter. Uh, these machines have a little laser beam that goes back and forth and uh, reflects off the berry. And if the berry isn't blue, if it's white, or it's uh, broken, or if it's green, then there's a little uh, puff of air that, that, that pushes those berries out. So they're able to very rapidly uh, clean these berries. We have to clean about uh, 100 million pounds in uh, about five weeks, a uh, 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 five week period of time in the summer. Uh, so th this has to be a fairly rapid process. They do have uh, uh, some quality control right at the end uh, where people are picking, uh, picking fruit uh, off on the lines to ensure anything the, machine, the laser sorter did not get. These are the bins that they go into. Uh, they're, uh, they're cardboard with a, a poly liner and they're about a thousand pounds. And so these can then be sold in bulk or they can be repackaged into small packages or 30 pound boxes. To, to be sold for the food service like restaurants and um, the like. The other uh, unique feature about wild blueberries and, and when I gave lectures on uh, to classes, they, they would actually know what an antioxidant was and wild blueberries have the highest level of uh, antioxidant capacity but with a Tufts uh, study out of 40 fruits and vegetables and generally tend to have about twice, uh, twice as much as cultivated blueberries. Uh, this work uh, was done at Tufts University. And uh, if you look off to the right here, here's some uh, free radicals uh, that, that are in there that, uh, what these do is they're supercharged oxygen molecules that disrupt DNA and cause aging, uh, can cause cancer. And blueberries themselves have a pigment in them called the anthocyanin, it's a blue pigment. And this blue pigment uh, is able to quench these, uh, these uh, free radical molecules and prevent them from doing the damage. So this is uh, something that we, uh, we found out from research from Tufts University. They also had another researcher, uh, Jim Joseph, with, with Barb, uh, his assistant, looking at animals and those animal trials, uh, they're able to uh, find that they improve the, the cognition of the animals and their, uh, their ability to uh, do physical tasks by feeding them a blueberry diet uh, versus a regular diet. And they also found the older rats could do as well as the younger rats uh, when fed a blueberry diet. So, uh, so blueberries helped these animals uh, uh, and their and their and their and their age to to act like younger animals. So blueberries have the highest antioxidant capacity of 40 fruits and vegetables. The, mem the memory and motor skills uh, improved with the blueberry diet. Uh, the University of Illinois showed that blueberries have cancer-fighting pro uh, promise. The blue pigment also helps reduce eye strain, improved eyesight by uh, improving uh, the. Uh, the ability for uh, um, the small capillaries to to uh, get the uh, get the blood. Blueberries are effective as cranberries to prevent urinary tract infections as well. Uh, so they have many many health uh, attributes: cardiovascular, brain health, also insulin response and cancer production. So blueberries uh, play a various role in many of these uh, in many of these functions. Blueberry products use uh, used to be that muffins uh, were the number one blueberry use. Uh, there's also uh, uh, glass jars in Germany, sugar, sugar infused, yogurts, muffin packaging. But now, uh, currently, the blueberry smoothie is now the number one uh, product uh, that uh, uses wild blueberries. It's healthier and, and actually uses a lot more blueberries than muffins or pies as well. So wild blueberries are really an ingredient and ingredient in bakery products or cereals uh, or uh, a product that's made into jams. This is a wild blueberry jam on the left made in Maine. 
the one on the right that's made in in Japan. The Japan the Japanese are 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 a big uh, source of of uh, eating wild blueberries. Uh, they're a fairly good market for us, and they do make jams uh, and other products from it uh, from the wild blueberries from Maine. We also have wild blueberry teas, uh, juices, wines. Uh, so there are lots of other products that are being made uh, with wild blueberries. And then there was a wild blueberry tea that was made by Highland Organics, and they found that it actually, with the leaves uh, plus the, uh, the blueberry, uh, some of the fruit had a higher antioxidant con uh, content uh, than uh, just the blueberries themselves. So that infusion of the leaves uh, plus the fruit gave you even more uh, uh, antioxidants. Uh, the development of new products, and, and this graph is kind of busy, but, but basically what it's showing you is uh, the green bar on the bottom was the bakery, and then new products, and that new product is actually dog food or pet food uh, that's being uh, produced. So we're seeing a lot more uses of uh, blueberries. We're generating new consumption and demand, and blueberries were now the market's favorite berry, according to one recent study. This graph shows uh, over since 2012 to 19, uh, the really uh, increase in production, productivity of both cultivated blueberries, uh, the green line uh, on the top, and uh, the next line below that of wild blueberries uh, that are being processed. And these cultivated blueberries, that's only about half the blueberry crop. Half the blueberry crop goes fresh, but the other half goes in to compete with wild blueberries and other products. And you can see for between 2017 and 18, we did have some uh, fairly poor weather conditions uh, that reduced uh, both the wild crop uh, for two years and the cultivated crop for, for one year. Looking at this graph, you can see where uh, the, the, the red line is Quebec, uh, which is much more erratic uh, production. They have a much more continental cl climate versus Maine and the Maritime provinces, um, milder climate. We also see that Maine uh, generally has been the highest producer of wild blueberries uh, between Maine and Maritimes, but in recent years, uh, there's been much more production in Quebec. More land has gone into, pro into uh, production. So in recent years, uh, Quebec has been the, the largest uh, producer of wild blueberry eclipsing Maine. So it's really a question uh, with the increased production, is there too many blueberries? Or is it just that there's too little demand of blueberries? And we have seen per capita consumption uh, since 1995 only about 15 and a half ounces, uh, all the way up to uh, 2015, 50 ounces. So now we're eating over uh, three pounds of blueberries uh, per capita uh, per person, uh, which is uh, good for the blueberry growers and also good for the people eating it. And looking at how much you need uh, to get that antioxidant effect for those health effects, generally with wild blueberries, you only need to get a half a cup of blueberries a day. And you can get that in muffins, uh, blueberry pie. You can get that in smoothies uh, and a lot of other products that, that they make uh, out of wild blueberries. If you do want to know more about the health message and the, 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 all of the research that's been uh, gone on for wild blueberries, you can go to wildblueberries.com. This is uh, a website that, uh, that is a promotional effort from the Wild Blueberry Association that tells you uh, all, all about uh, the health attributes of blueberries and the marketing of blueberries. The other uh, website is a cooperative extension website, wildblueberries.maine.edu. Uh, this is currently maintained by Billy Calderwood, who is the current wild blueberry specialist. And it gives a lot more information on uh, the production, uh, a lot more detail on the production, and even how to extract seed and uh, create your own blueberry plants. Uh, if you want to plant them out uh, in your locations as well. So remember that wild blueberries have twice the antioxidants uh, of cultivated blueberries and also pick always wild and never tame. And tame blueberries actually is the official name of the cultivated blueberry. So uh, with that,
Uh, Shane, I could uh, entertain yes. any questions. We have several questions, David, that have okay. come through. The first one is, so drought conditions are good for blueberry yield? No, uh, actually drought conditions are bad for blueberry yield. And that's why they put in irrigation systems. Although blueberries are, uh, the plant is a very good stress survivor. It does very well uh, not getting killed from the drought. Uh, but if we want to maintain a higher productivity, which we need in our commercial fields, then uh, we need to add water. That's why they put the irrigation. So no, uh, dry weather is not good for, for blueberries. They need about an inch of rain a week, like most crops. Okay, uh, the next question, what percentage of Maine blueberries are organically grown? I did mean to, uh, mean to mention that when I did the organic slide. Uh, of 100 million pounds, we probably have less than 1 million that's, uh, that's organic, between a half million and a million. That, uh, of that, there are about uh, 500 wild blueberry growers, but about 50 of those growers are organic growers. And, and some of the organic growers are more diversified, and some of them just, uh, uh, just sell their blueberries uh, locally. Uh, they have their own customers. They go to farmer's markets. There is one uh, blueberry company, uh, Merrill's Blueberry in Hancock, Maine, that freezes uh, wild blueberries, the only organic wild blueberry freezer in the state. So there is a little bit more of a commercial side of the, of, of the organic production now, uh, but a lot of that organic production is local and uh, sold locally as well. Excellent. The next question from the audience is, what about colony collapse syndrome from imported honeybees? Well, that's been an issue. We, Frank Drummond, uh, has, our entomologist, has been uh, spending many years on this, and he's been monitoring the hives. And we, we do see uh, the real problem, uh, underlying problem with colony collapse is that used to be oh, four or 5,000 uh, or 6,000 hives in the United States. And, and basically, honeybees are migrant workers. Uh, they're brought in, they do a job, they go somewhere else. And there's quite a bit of stress uh, on, those, on those bees, moving them from place to place. And uh, with that stress, there's much more now because there's only two or three million hives doing the same job that five or six million hives are doing. So the movement of the hives and the stress on the hives, there's also, uh, there are vectors of um, disease and mites uh, that, weak, uh, that weaken the hive. And they, they found that all these factors of stress, the moving, uh, the disease, uh, the, the parasites have caused this uh, colony collapse. And they found if they manage the hives properly and take precautions and not overwork them, and also treat, uh, treat for parasites and diseases, they're able to, to mitigate much of that. Uh, so that all, although the colonies collapse, they tend to collapse after blueberries are pollinated. So what happens is they rebuild those hives uh, again with new queens and they build them back up for next year. So honeybees are a renewable resource, although it, it is more expensive um, and uh, basically a lot of it has to do with the stress and, and, and the diseases and parasites uh, that, uh, that are there. We also, you know, there, there are also stressors can be sprays, uh, insecticides, and we do try to definitely minimize any of those type of applications uh, when the bees are in the field and fungicides as well to uh, prevent the, those uh, honeybees from being exposed. So that's our, you know, uh, it does exist. Uh, it's an ongoing issue, uh, but it's manageable if, if, the, uh, if the growers uh, man or, if, or if the beekeepers manage the hives well. Thank you. Uh, the next question from the audience, are there concerns with climate change and blueberry production? Is there a correlation between temperature and productivity? Yes, uh, very, very much so. Uh, I've, I've got another talk on climate change for <laughs> a wild blueberries that I give, but essentially it's positive and negative effect. So the positive effect of climate change is that we have a longer grower season in the fall, and uh, that's allowed our plants to grow longer and produce more buds, and it also has allowed us to change where we grow blueberries. We used to grow them very close to the coast, 
and never, uh, if you go, go north down east above Route 9, we never could grow blueberries around Route 9, route nine or above Route 9, uh, but we can now. And so this has opened up the possibility of more areas and greater production. But on the downside, what we're seeing is very erratic weather conditions. Uh, the last uh, two out of the last four years, we've had a killing frost and it's reduced uh, that plus drought has reduced the crop by about 50%. And that's really not sustainable. And uh, that's why uh, with the drought piece, a lot of uh, growers are looking now that they're almost going to have to uh, invest in irrigation, uh, which is a, a very large cost, a very large added cost, but it does provide uh, protection. And we're also seeing on, on the pest management end uh, with the longer growing season, the warmer weather, we're seeing more pests, we're seeing different pests. We have this uh, a tipworm that, that's in our fields that we never had 10 years ago. Uh, spotted wing Drosophila is another fruit fly that's come into the state uh, uh, that uh, is getting into our fields and really builds up uh, by the end of the, our season. Luckily, it, it, it it doesn't start at the beginning of the season so that we could uh, rake our berries earlier and not have to, to spray for that. But there, so there's more insect and disease pressure uh, and there's more erratic uh, 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 weather conditions which cause drought and frost or freezes that reduce production as well. So the net effect has been uh, somewhat positive, but the last four of the five years, it's, very, uh, it's been very negative uh, with, with especially with the freezers uh, taking out the fruit. Even we used to get frost that hit the blossoms and now we're getting a freeze that actually kills, uh, kills the fruit after they've been pollinated. And this is something that uh, we're just starting to see uh, now. Okay, the next question from the audience, is there a significant nutritional difference between wild and cultivated blueberries? Well, they're essentially, they're, they're very similar plants. Uh, nutritionally, um, the only real difference is uh, that the cultivated blueberries are a lot larger and uh, they're not as concentrated. So we have uh, a little bit more higher concentration of the phytonutrients uh, like the anthocyanins. And we also, uh, there's one other element, uh, manganese, uh, which, is, uh, which is used for bone health we have very high levels of that, but otherwise they're pretty similar. In fact, the high bush blueberry and the low bush blueberry that exist wild in Maine are able to cross pollinate and produce progeny that is a hybrid. Uh, we call it a half high blueberry. So they're really fairly closely related, uh, but we feel our wild blueberries, uh, the, the, the mixture of uh, the different clones uh, provide us higher levels of uh, anthocyanins and about twice the phytonutrients of wild blueberries. Otherwise, uh, the, other, the other mineral nutrients, except for manganese, are fairly the same. Okay, in what month do the fields turn red is our next question. Well, uh, actually, they, they start turning red after you harvest. <laughs> you run a harvester through the fields and the, and the plants uh, turn red and, and started to turn red in August. But it's with a cooler temperature. So uh, September, October, definitely uh, by mid-September, you're starting to see, uh, see the fields turn. Uh, the frost is coming a lot, a lot later. When I was a student back in the 1970s, I remember getting a killing frost uh, by the 20th of September. And now that frost really doesn't occur until uh, late October and even into, into November sometimes. So it's changed. And again, with the, the warmer falls, it's shifting. But if you want to go down and see the fields, I would say in, into September and, and into October, you, you could go at it. So it's really quite spectacular uh, with those open blueberry barns, uh, seeing uh, hundreds and thousands of acres of uh, red. Okay, the next question, David, how many seeds does each berry produce and how long does one seed take to grow into a productive plant? Good question. And, and the, the number of seeds really depends on, again, the pollination, having, uh, having pollinated. There could be anywhere from a, a dozen to 60 seeds in, in a blueberry fruit, depending on uh, the variety. Uh, different, different clones have different genetics. Uh, some are more productive than others and uh, in the pollination process. Generally, the, 
you can take that fruit uh, and extract the seed and plant that out. And that, that, uh, that would have to be put in, uh, there's a layer of peat moss and uh, moisture. And usually the, there's, a, there's a, um, a, um, instructions on the web on how to do this to, to germinate uh, wild blueberry seeds. Thing is, you have to be patient. Uh, they might take uh, 30 days or more to germinate. And so you get these very little tiny seedlings and you take those seedlings out and you put them into, uh, say, a, uh, a, um, something you transplant uh, tomato seeds, uh, seedlings into and grow those out uh, at the end of the year. Generally, they need to go into a, uh, some kind of cold frame or bed for another year or two. And then you'd have a plant maybe uh, six or eight inches tall. Uh, they would actually start to have uh, some blossoms on it at that point in time. Uh, but the issue of the wild blueberry is, is you get these very small plants and that plant itself might take uh, 20 or 30 years to grow into any reasonable size. So uh, the real reason that we don't have wild blueberries uh, distributed throughout the world is that they don't propagate uh, by cuttings very easily. Uh, seedlings are very small, so if you establish a field, you'd have to have a very high density in fact, most people that want blueberry fields, uh, especially on the coast, uh, if they want to put fields in, they dig up uh, blueberry sod. We have some uh, a grower at Suncase, uh, Suncase Blueberry Farm that actually has a sustainable method of cutting the sod. They put those sods in and then the sods uh, spread in so to give you a quicker establishment. So I would say, you know, for your backyard, you know, you're looking at before you get any kind of production 10 years, and you know, for for some of these blueberry fields, uh, they've been in fields they've been in uh, 50 or 100 years uh, before they really fill in completely. So, uh, and it depends on the management too. If you prune them and fertilize them, and 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 they have to have uh, full sunlight. So there's a lot of factors. So generally, uh, for people, uh, if you really want wild blueberries, it's probably best to <laughs> buy the organic uh, at at the uh, at your farmer's market or buy the frozen ones in the freezer with from Wyman's and uh, because it's uh, it's quite difficult to, for you to get any any amount of wild blueberries uh, in a lifetime. Well thank you for fielding all of these questions and we do have three more. Uh, the yeah. next one, how to avoid toxic pesticides use in cultivation? Well uh, generally you know they're, they're organic uh, standards uh, but they use, they use pesticides. All pesticides are toxic. Uh, generally, uh, if the plants, if their labels are followed, uh, the levels are considered non-toxic uh, in the fruit. They, we also have the advantage with wild blueberries is that we have a two year cropping cycle and this enables us to uh, manage a lot of the, of the pests or have a much less pest pressure uh, here in the north. Uh, so we tend to use uh, much fewer than you would in cultivated blueberries. So we might use uh, maybe a tenth of the amount of pesticides they use. In some years, they, they might not use any at all. Uh, they have a two-year cycle. They apply some the first year. It's just uh, with the fungicides and the insecticides, uh, those are only applied uh, if needed, when needed. So it's really, and all of the berries are tested and all the berries uh, come in uh, under the, the, the certification from the EPA. So there should be, there should be no questions. I, I guess if you, if you want to grow them themselves or you want to buy organic, that, that probably would uh, further minimize the, the, any kind of pesticide residues, but it, uh, it still wouldn't completely eliminate them. Okay, an audience member asks, you said some plants have been in fields since the Civil War. So what is the average length life, uh, the average length of life of a plant? And what is the oldest plant known? That's a good question. Uh, we don't know that. Uh, we can only observe uh, what's been in the field, but there's a Swedish study that they, they did. And, you know, it, it's, it's not exactly the same plant. It's just the, it's just the progeny of that plant. There's a, there's a, None of those stems probably are hundreds, uh, hundreds of years old, but 
some of the stems, uh, certainly, yeah, they could be 100 years old, some of the rhizomes. I think they can uh, take those out and, and try to uh, age them, but I don't know that there's been any studies, uh, but just the amount of time it would take for one small studentling to grow into a football field uh, would definitely be hundreds of years. And that plant is all genetically the same or progeny of the, the dead stems that grew and new stems grew up uh, from that. So uh, we don't have any specific scientific studies that exactly uh, date like carbon dating or things like that they're not that old to do that but we do know that they uh, did come with a glacier which is 10,000 years ago we do know that these have been in the fields uh, when the colonists came over and uh, the same plants are there uh, that were uh, uh, as, as evidenced by the, the large size of the plant and the time it takes to grow so not exact, but that's the reasoning, and that's why we 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 say they're 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 hundreds of years. Okay, the next question reads: I have read, heard that eighty percent of the actual owners of the land under the fields in Maine are widowed women, possibly from inheritance. Well, I, I've never heard that one. <laughs> I guess um, there were. I think uh, the ownership of the fields really have, we do know they've been passed on to, you know, family members. A lot of times those family members have moved out of state. Uh, so you tend to get lots of ownership with multiple owners that live in multiple states. We also have several land holdings with large companies that have it. But I, I don't know that, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I see these uh, guys, <laughs> these men growing blueberries and they're 85 and 90 and they're still, they're still at it. So I, I think, uh, you know, growing blueberries or eating blueberries uh, is something. And, and it's not just the, the women that are growing the, uh, there in the fields uh, that, that own the fields now. But uh, I don't know that we have, uh, I've ever seen that statistic or seen that measured, but I would say that there is, uh, you know, when we did uh, some workshops, uh, probably five or ten, five or ten years ago, the average age of the participant was 65. So, you know, there's some very old blueberry growers out there, and some of that land is being uh, picked up by other people, or sold, or turned over to to new owners. Uh, but it doesn't seem like there's a a lot of family, there's a, there's very few family farms uh, in, in Maine uh, that are growing uh, blueberries traditionally in the family, but there's a lot of owners out there that uh, are turning land over uh, and are, are, are really quite old. And sort of relating to that, David, a question just came in. Are wild blueberry fields in Maine in danger of being sold and developed and lost forever? Well, you know, I, I see, and, and I've, uh, I've just been involved with a nature conservancy or a conservancy in uh, the Kennebec Highlands. A lot of these fields, uh, many of these fields along the coast uh, have been uh, taken up by land trusts. There's uh, quite a few. Um, I don't really see big developments. Uh, I mean, if you're in a more populated center, we did see uh, when uh, around the, the rock, uh, around the, uh, Belfast area uh, when the credit card company was there there were a lot of fields that were sold off and developed and houses put in we are seeing fields right along the coast where the ocean is certainly uh, the development value of those fields uh, far exceeds what you can make with blueberries so we're seeing a lot of those fields being uh, put into houses uh, large houses but we're also seeing as I mentioned uh, a lot of new fields opening up further north in wilder areas and more uh, more remote areas so there's been a shift in, in ownership of the fields but i i don't believe uh that we're going to see a lot of these areas that are, are just being in big commercial development because most of these fields are in, at least in washington county in very remote areas and so I, I i don't we see some of that happening especially on the coast uh, but not really further inland Okay, well, we want to thank you for fielding all of those questions. I'm glad there was so much interest in the talk. 
Um, we want to thank David Yarborough for joining us this evening with Rockland Public Library. Thank you so much, David. It's been a pleasure. Sorry about the glitch with the, uh, the slides. I'm not sure what happened. That's quite all right. I think everybody is patient and just grateful to have virtual programming. And we're certainly grateful that you joined us this evening. Um, comments coming in, thanking you for this great lecture. Uh, people clapping and thumbs up and saying, yeah. So we thank you. And we thank our audience for the great questions for David and for taking the time to attend this evening. Um, and with that, we will close out. This is Shane at Rockland Library, and I wish you all a great evening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.